can I tell you a stupid story related to pizza? Cause you brought it up. So when I was a kid being like a fat kid in Chicago, I thought pizza was like the coolest shit in the fucking world. Right. And in my head, I thought it would be like, I thought being able to make pizzas, like being a go dude that works in like a kitchen, making pizzas was like a cool, like sick job to have. And I told that to my dad and he, he used to make pizzas when he was younger. Cause he had an uncle uh, that owned an Italian restaurant called, called Rinaldi's in Chicago years ago. And he used to make pizzas there. And I was like, I thought pizza was so cool that I didn't believe my dad. I was like, there's no fucking way you made pizzas. I wasn't, I wasn't swearing at him as a child, but like, I remember distinctly thinking, I'm like, there's no way you could. And obviously it's like, I could probably get a job making pizzas now if I really wanted to, but like, I just couldn't believe it. Hey, what's up, everyone? Matt here from Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. I hope that you had a killer weekend. I most certainly did. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter. And if you are ever in Montreal, trust me when I say this, if you are looking for a killer show to go to, Heavy Montreal will have you covered. I am beyond stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there's someone in your life that just loves extreme music and loves craft beer, well, you should definitely let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast exists. You could tell them that there are over 400 episodes where I sit down with some of the world's best metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while enjoying craft beers. If you would encourage one of your metalhead beer loving friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now today on the podcast, I'm very stoked to adjacent nits of Warforge and Spent Case. Get ready everyone, this is Vox and Hops episode number 449. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm very stoked to be with Jason Nitz of Warforge, of Spent Case, um, my friend that we, we hung out with for 30 days um, back in September. We are recording this at a Thirsty Thursday virtual hang. I have not recorded a live interview here since July 2023, so this is by far long overdue. Very, very long intro. Just to say, Jason, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. How about you, man? I'm good. I feel good. It took me like a long time to get back into the swing of things after I went to Asia. Uh, I was extremely jet lagged for the first time in a very basically ever in my life. I was I was unfunctional past 8 p.m. and then highly, <laughs> yeah. highly awake at 4 a.m. Uh, it took a few weeks to get back into the swing of things. And then, you know, the holidays and I, I'm pretty much back now, which makes me really, really, really happy. You, how are you? Let's, it's about you, though. Let's, let's just dig straight into this. Um, what are you drinking? It's Vox and Hops. Let's do this. So I got two beverages here. Um, one, my nice one for the podcast, is the Vox and Hops Pit Culture edition of Knits Blitz, which uh, you and Mick had a hand in helping create, which is a huge honor, honestly. Um, so I'm actually trying. I told you before we started tracking this, I've not had a chance to try this at all yet, so... I thought, what better opportunity than now? So I'm going to crack into this thing. And then also, um, oop, as it spills on Max's computer desk. Sorry, Max. <laughs> um, I also have a bottle of water with some liquid IV, tangerine flavored, which is like the immune booster. So <laughs> I try yes. to drink like no. one of these a day. Good job. Um, Stay hydrated. Keep, keep immune systems up. Who knows what's out there? Despite what everyone's saying, there's still like the common cold people. Yes, exactly. I'm there just is the common around. <laughs> <laughs> that is a cool beer. And uh, we, there is still one pit culture to come uh, from Ribald Brewing uh, out of uh, California. And that is a project that I did last year presented by Metal Injection with Yakima Chief Hops. Uh, they gave all the hops that they needed for this brew for free from Yakima Chief Hops. Love them. Love Luke Bo year and i released 30 beers across the globe including that one and your friend mick which uh i'm sure his name's going to come up a lot in this uh interview and he's actually in this zoom right now um there's a lot of history between you and him uh where i pitched him the project and he came up with this name to honor basically you i think that's awesome it was very sweet and very flattering when you guys sent me that message i was just kind of like very like jaw to the floor moment. Pretty much that whole month of September, if I'm being honest with you, was like my jaw was on the floor the entire fucking time. But 
it just kept getting like cooler and cooler and cooler. And then it puts you in that headspace where you're like, how the fuck did I get here? Like, how am I on tour with Cryptopsy right now? How the fuck are, do you have a hand in naming a beer after me? Like, it's just one of those, like, this is very humbling. Oh. Like, well, all I, combined together. I enjoyed a bunch of those. Uh, I called it blitz nits on my paper. Nits blitzes uh, <laughs> on, 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 on that tour. And I, I shared a bunch of them with, with the rest of the bus, uh, the Visceral Disgorge guys, the rest of the Cryptopsy guys, uh, with, with, with a lot of pleasure. Truly a crusher, delicious, uh, light haze. On my side, I got a special beer that um, made its way to me uh, all the way from Kelowna, B.C., and it's sort of like an homage to Warforged after touring with you guys and watching you guys play so many times over that tour, the Carnival of Death tour. We were like, try to, you know, you know how bands are. We, we, we love to like genre define and, and try to figure out where bands fit. And Warforge is a strange one, and so is this beer. So this is a Barrel Age Mass Collider, number eight from Jackknife Brewing out of Kelowna, B.C. Shout out to Brad, who I'm going to hang out this weekend, actually. Uh, it's their annual collab with friends uh, where they take uh, fresh pressed apple juice from the valley, and they boil it together in their kettle for hours and hours before it's sent off to ferment with farmhouse yeast. Uh, I've drank a few of these jackknife beers, and they love the farm, the, the farmhouse yeast culture. Uh, so, so they age this in a red wine barrel. So you can see it's a, I can see Steph scratching his beard, uh, the, the, our, our, one of our local beer nerds here, uh, saying, what the fuck is going on there? And that's what happens with Warforge, and it's a good thing. So let me crack this, <laughs> pour it out, and you, know, you take a sip of yours. I'll take a sip of mine. Uh, tell Mick what you think about it, and then we'll talk about your very first beers. Okay, hell yeah. <laughs> okay. Cheers, Matt. This is delicious. Ooh. It's very flavor. I'm so not good with like being a beer dude, but I'm going to say right now, it's very hoppy. It is very flavorful. And I think I would drink this again. Um, it's very rich tasting. And uh, I like, um, I, need a, I need a little bit more to, to really like crack into it. But this is like, this is very good. Hell yes. Mine smells funky on the nose, wild and weird. I love it. Hell yeah. I love the can too. That was a really cool, like that black can with like the black lid on it. I love the black cans. A lot more metal breweries need to, to lean into the black yeah. cans. Uh, the lid is black. It's very cool. They're very metal. And he sent me a bunch of, um, they also make killer pizza. He sent me a bunch of merch, which I was wearing the other day, uh, which is also killer, like a demon eating a pizza and, and crushing a beer. Just very cool. Col check it out, people. Kelowna, uh, Jack Knife Brewing, and obviously check out Miskatonic Brewing, uh, where Mick Dempsey works. Shout out to Mick once again for Make Nits Blitz for the uh, Metal Injection Presents Pit Culture Project. Let's take us back now, back to your youth. What was your very first beer experience? You know what? It was probably my dad's a big beer drinker. Right. And my dad likes to drink on a budget. He's a smart man. So uh, I want to say my very first beer tasting experience was probably him drinking like a Stroh's, which is not the nicest <laughs> kind of beer. I've never um, had one of those. <laughs> it's like I don't honestly I haven't seen one in years. I don't even know if they make it anymore. It used to be my dad's like go to, though. And I remember I definitely would be like, yo, let me try it. And he would let me try it. And I just like immediately I was like, this doesn't taste like Sprite. So <laughs> it Why not is it about not it. sweet? Why is it not delicious? <laughs> right, exactly. And then I remember trying uh, some more over the years. Like my mom would like to drink High Life. Sometimes I would try a High Life. And she's not really a big, she's never really been a big beer drinker. And she never would like drink at home or anything like that. But yeah, I remember my first few experience. I remember that. And then hard alcohol it was... Uh, Captain Morgan was the first thing I tried. Somebody gave me like a little sip at like a 4th of July family friend party thing. And I also remember being like, this tastes like powerful and very intense. And uh, yeah, that's probably, <laughs> that's probably my earliest memories with alcohol in general or beer. I'm not the biggest beer drinker in the world. So I don't want everybody on here to think I'm a fucking poser. <laughs> But, uh, no, no, it's a, the, the beer is literally an icebreaker. Like the, the craft beer is my passion. I just force it upon yeah. everyone. I do have a high <laughs> life story. Uh, we went and played Milwaukee Metal Fest when it wasn't good anymore. 
And yeah. uh, this is not with Crypt Chops, it's another band. And we bought okay. a bunch of Miller High Life, and we laughed so much that it was called the Champagne of Beer. And we didn't realize the ABV was so low. So us being from Montreal, and typically we, we have high ABV beers here, 6 Seven, eight percent, whatever, and we 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 can take a few back in the day, and we were crushing b- these high lives and feeling nothing, and we were quite disappointed when we found out there were three point five percent or so. Yeah, yeah, I'd recommend Stroh's, man. Next time, <laughs> next time you catch them, if you see them at any store, pick up a case of Stroh's, start slamming those. Next I've time, I've heard they give. I've heard they give that like ham's headache in the morning, like it's a similar vibe, but I think it's, Stros. I like the idea of the beer Stros and they used to come, I think their packaging has been different since back when my dad would drink them, but they used to come in these really cool, like dark, like navy blue cans with this cool red label, like a red logo. And then like the top of the can was always gold. It was sick. Cool can. I was prob- there's probably a picture of it somewhere if you go on Google. I'm I will sure. hunt for but Stros. I, I'm, I'm in. I want, I want the ham's head up. Headache. Can I tell you a stupid story related to pizza because you brought it up? So when I was a kid, being like a fat kid in Chicago, I thought pizza was like the coolest shit in the fucking world, right? And in my head, I thought it would be like, I thought being able to make pizzas, like being a go- dude that works in like a kitchen making pizzas was like a cool, like sick job to have. And I told that to my dad and he, he used to make pizzas when he was younger because he had an uncle uh, that owned an Italian restaurant called, called Rinaldi's in Chicago years ago. And he used to make pizzas there. And I was like, I thought pizza was so cool that I didn't believe my dad. I was like, there's no fucking way you made pizzas. I wasn't I wasn't swearing at him as a child. But like, I remember distinctly thinking, I'm like, there's no way you can. And obviously, it's like I could probably get a job making pizzas now if I really wanted to. But like at that point, at that point, it was like rock star level. It's like it's like (laughs) touring the world. Yeah, That's how I thought. I was like, you make pizzas. What's cooler, death metal or pizzas? I like both, but <laughs> and Chicago's big for pizza. So, but yeah, that's that's like probably my best pizza story I got. I love that. I love that. But you never, you never went and made pizzas. I never pursued that passion, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'm only 32, so there's that's a lot I'm of saying. life there's left. Still time. You never know. Yeah, <laughs> there is still <laughs> there is still time. If Warforge kicks the bucket. Catch me at your local fucking pizza spot in Chicago. I'll be in the kitchen. Hell yes. Uh, <laughs> continuing with your dad, uh, the soundtrack of your youth, the classic Vox and Hops question. Um, what was playing in your house when you were not in control of the radio? What did your parents or guardians listen to? Oh, wow. Uh, I, I, I believe that my parents have like sick ass taste in music. My dad loves like, he loves rock. He's a big rock. They're both big rock and roll fans, my parents. But my dad definitely dabbled more in like progressive rock. Um, and so did my mom, like my dad, my dad's favorite bands were bands like Rush, King Crimson, um, Tears for Fears, Radiohead, shit like that. And then my mom's favorite artist is Todd Rundgren, who's a fairly, you know, progressive artist. So I was exposed to a lot of that stuff at a young age. Like my first, probably my first memory of music was my dad back, the house I grew up in was in Chicago proper, um, and not the nicest area, but I remember distinctly like my dad showing me in our basement at the time because he had this big like he still has the stereo system and it works. But he put on um, I think the song's called A Little Black Spot on the Sun by the police and then Break It Down Again by Tears for Fears. And those two songs were like the first time I really remember like music clicking with me in general. And then from there, it was just like all downhill. Like (laughs) my dad just like opened his record collection to me like. I got into all the old Rush records, every Rush record that was out at the time, uh, was big into King Crimson, oh, Genesis, yeah. things along along those lines. Um, and then my mom, like, has always, I feel like, been a little more subtle with what she likes compared to my, my dad's a little more, like, all over the place. I'll check out anything and just see how it goes, which is cool because, like, I remember the day my dad brought home uh, the CD copy of Kid A by Radiohead, like when it came out. And to this yeah. day, it's like one of my favorite records of all time. Was he, was he stoked heard, or was he pissed? Because some, oh, some Radiohead he, fans were super pissed about that. That was his first Radiohead record, yeah. actually. He had not listened to the band before that. And he liked the song, Optim- I think it's called Optimistic or yeah. Optimist. Something and, like that. Uh, yeah. And he was just like, I love this song. And he put on, he loved the record too. And at the time, it was probably the craziest shit I had ever heard in my life. Like... That song Idiotech, which is basically like a dance, electronic dance song. Yeah. Like I never heard anything like that in my entire life at that point. And I was young. I don't know how old I was when that came out, but I was very young. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And at the time, I just remember thinking, like, who the fuck would listen to this? And now I, like, <laughs> listen to that record at least, like, once a month. <laughs> yeah, I'll Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. That's cool. That's a whole plethora of stuff right there. The 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 progressive side of stuff with King's Crimson, the, the technicality of drumming with, with Rush and all that. Yeah. The the wacky dancing of, of Tom York uh, from Radiohead. <laughs> yeah. Which I do have to give a shout out to um, The Smile, which is his new project, just dropped a record last week, and it's incredible. I've heard such good things. Yeah. I've only heard once Brody from Rivers of Nile. We were actually just on the phone earlier today. He sent me a single of theirs like last week to it's check out. And it, I, yeah. I still haven't heard the first album by The Smile, so I need to go back and hear <laughs> that. But that single was amazing. It yeah. reminded me, I hate saying it, and I don't want to compare it to Radiohead, but it kind of reminded me of like In Rainbows era Radiohead stuff, which because I really like. Also, me too. I, I got dirty viruses on my computer trying to download that free <laughs> <laughs> back in the day when they dropped that free. Yeah, I, I remember to, that. I went to the wrong link. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was so innovative at the time, though. Like them doing that. I remember everybody being like, what? They're putting out yeah. the record for, for free. free. Like, yeah, it was like a mind blowing thing at the time, awesome. which is cool. It's their fault. But <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it's their fault. You and I got to go make pizzas on the side. I know. That's what I'm saying. But secretly, I think it's cool. But <laughs> <laughs> how about shows? Do you remember the first show you went to go see? Oh, fuck. Yes, I do. I was in fourth grade. Really? This was at, uh, yeah, I was 10 years old. So I thought I automatically, I thought I'm like, I'm the fucking shit. I'm 10. I'm going to a rock show. It was at the UIC pavilion or the UIC theater, which is the university of Illinois in Chicago. So it was in the city. It was good. Charlotte was headlining, uh, newfound glory. The pop punk band was direct support and the ska band less than Jake. opened Holy up. Shit. And I loved all three bands at the time. So I was so geeked to be there we stayed for the whole show my mom like i remember my friend's dad took us to go and my mom gave me money for like a hoodie i bought a good charlotte hoodie and then the next day i wore it to school i was like yo this yeah. is sick <laughs> like wearing your um, emblem you're wearing it yeah exactly so that was my first show and then my second show was a metal show it was system of the down uh at the Allstate arena and they had the mars volt this was like when Hypnotize came out. No, Mesmerize. I'm sorry. That's the first one. Um, and they had the Mars Volta on direct support, and they just put out Francis the Mute, that second record uh, that was I like huge that record, for them. Yeah. Yeah. And the band, uh, are you familiar with the band Hella? Um, I am not. No. It's the drummer from that band Death Grips. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's his old project, and they're kind of like a math rock band. They opened the show, and it was like a two piece or like a three piece or something. I barely remember, but. At, I love Hella. I think they're a sick band now. At the time, though, I had no idea how to comprehend that kind of music because it was so technical. And seeing it in, a, in an arena was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it didn't make any sense to me at the time. And like 10 years later, once I really got into them, I was like, fuck, I wish I like got I, I wish I could relive that moment. But I still remember just like being in shock at the performance because I was like, this is so weird and different. I totally have a similar experience, except this with Meshuggah. Meshuga opened for Tool back in 2002, yeah. I want to say 2000, 2001, uh, here in Montreal. And I went and saw Tool in my mind and this band opened and I was like, what is this band? And I didn't understand <laughs> anything. And then five, six years later, they became my best favorite band. And Dude, they're so sick. It's undeniable how sick that band is. Like, But in, in, in like an arena and hypothetically the sound guy didn't have it dialed in. Yeah, it it could be difficult. How about drums? At what point was well, I imagine? Is it Neil Peart's fault? Uh, at what point did <laughs> did uh, drums become a big part of your life? It's like partially Neil Peart, but mostly my dad's fault. Like my dad was a drummer when I was younger. Um, he never like played in any bands or anything, but he had when he turned forty, he had like a midlife crisis birthday and bought a drum kit. Really? And yeah, like yeah, in the he house a drum type kit. thing. Yeah, yeah, he had a drum kit in the basement. It was a a TKO percussion kit, which was like, I don't even know if they're a company anymore. They were like a cheap subsidiary of Pearl. Um, and he had just like a five piece kit, two rack toms, one floor tom kick and a snare, like three cymbals maybe. But at the time I was so young that just seeing that was so fascinating to me that I was like, I need to figure out how to fucking do this. And like my dad, I would listen like back then I was listening to bands like the offspring and green day and 
songs that didn't have super complex drumming. So like I would show them to my dad. He would listen to them for like five minutes and he'd be like, this is how you play it. And he would just oh, show me like okay. the simple. So beat. he always had like, the drums oh, in him. Shit. Had he played before the, the midlife crisis purchase or he did play before he took a few lessons when he was younger, he gave up cause he never found a band or never found anybody else that was really that interested in music. So he never really pursued it much more than like when he was a kid. He's like um, a few years too late because now everybody needs a goddamn drummer. Drummers are <laughs> yeah, in every freaking band. Yo, I will say my dad <laughs> used to be a fucking sick ass drummer too. Like he would just like, he's good at like the few things he knows, but he would sit on the kit and just rip something. I'm like, fuck, I cannot do that. Like, I don't, I, he hasn't played drums in years. I'd be so curious to hear if he could still bust it out and just see what it sounds like. But yeah, he used to like blow my mind. I would just be like, he, you're like, I would be like, why didn't you fucking do this shit? But he's like me. He's like dumb guy drummer. Like we don't have any formal training. We don't feel. know how to read music. Yeah, it's like we nice. learn by ear. It's wow. feel stuff. So, so eventually you 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 started learning the Offspring and all these things that you liked at that point. Yep. Uh, do you remember your first show playing drums? Yes, uh, I was in a band. I don't even remember what we were calling ourselves at the time. The couple names I remember we were going between were like Lethal Injection and uh, Murder and Cold Blood. And we played like this, like this showcase that was in Chicago downtown in a, like an area called Lakeview. It was at uh, a theater that no longer exists anymore. Which happens. Um, yeah. I don't even remember what it was called, but it was, I, I did play my first show there. I was 15, I think, or 14, 14 or 15. Um, and we, we opened up, there was like four other metal bands on it. And it was like a battle of the bands thing, which we definitely lost. Um, but it was fun. Like it was the first time my dad came to the show, helped me set up the kit. Cause I Hell had yes. no fucking clue what I was doing. Uh, you had a roadie, but, you had a roadie from day one. Yeah, exactly. He, and he called himself the roadie. He was just so stoked to be there. Like my parents were there, like all of our parents, like everybody in the band's parents were there. Were you jamming um, at your house? Yes, we would practice at my house because I had the drum kit all exactly. the time. So my parents' basement was the and you know, like, thank God for them because they've always been so supportive of, like, all of the music to this day. Like, they are, were hitting me up today. They were like, can you send me the link to, like, this shit? Like, how can I see you on the podcast? Like, it's really cool. It's, like, awesome that I've had parents because I know so many kids that, like, grew up with parents that didn't want them doing yeah. it or didn't give a yeah. fuck or just, like, didn't understand didn't metal support in general. It, especially here in in north america or in canada or a few other countries as well because i've been speaking with so many artists from sweden recently and um from switz switzerland also i just had a chat with another artist from switzerland and the arts are so encouraged over there in schools and then there's community center hubs where there's free gear and you can like rent to own and there's like jam spaces and playing music is just a natural part of people's lives whereas here it's literally seen as a hobby. So it's great to have your parents that just always make it more like a, a hobby that is an acceptable hobby that you could hypothetically do more with. Right, exactly. And I was just very much, once I like really took the deep dive into music and realized like, this is where I feel like I have a connection and a passion. It was just like, I'm coming home from school every day, playing drums all night, like play drums for like five hours a fucking night, just jamming. There was, there was no time songs. where they were like, look. You got to stop. <laughs> uh, times where like my grades were fucking up because I didn't give a shit about oh, yeah. school. They were just like, and then I learned how to like play the school system and be like, I could get a 3.5 GPA and still crush it on the kit. That was kind of like the perfect formula. What's but the, yeah, what's the it was cheat code there? Uh, unveil. Doing un all of your homework in school. Don't listen. Uh. Like, yeah, doing all of your homework in the class where they're assigning it. And hopefully your teacher isn't pissed that you're doing it. Uh, there was a handful of times where I would get yelled at cause they'd be like, you're doing the assignment now. I'm like, yeah, what, you know, what the fuck am I supposed I wanna, to do? I want to get it done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to go home and learn Black Dahlia songs. Like I ain't got time for math. Like, <laughs> but <laughs> that, that was my next question. The evolution of your playing at what point did the offspring and everything else, Green Day, let's say become too simple and you got, what's this story of, of discovering, let's say the double pedal blast beats, where did that all come from? And the struggle, did you like when I first heard extreme vocals, let's say I never imagined I would ever do that. So is that something that you felt as well? Oh, yeah. Like the first like so the offspring and Green Day ended up turning into like King Crimson Rush, more prog rock stuff, which ended up uh, I ended up in high school and like my 
freshman year in high school, the first, the two records that really like fucked me up and did it to me. And I was like, I need to do this were annihilation of the wicked by Nile and uh, demigod by behemoth. Like those two records. I had never heard drums that fast before in my life. I, I don't think I, and to this day, I would still argue that annihilation of the wicked is like, one of the heaviest death metal records. It just sounds like you're getting the shit kicked out of you. <laughs> it's so pissed. It's so mean. I was just like, fuck, I love how this, and it's like, it just sounds like someone's grabbing your head and shaking it for like however long the fucking record is. <laughs> and it's just like, I remember hearing that and I was like, this is like the most aggressive thing I've ever heard in my life. I need to figure out a way to do it. And obviously, you know, when you're a drummer approaching death metal drums and you see a dude like George Coleus or even Inferno from Behemoth hitting like 280 beats per minute, it's just kind of like, mm. they're, they're still hitting too. They're not, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Hard. So it was like, there's that video on YouTube. Uh, it's like, to me, it's infamous. It's George Coleus going from like 200 to 280 beats per minute. It's on like drummer world's channel. It's from like 15 years ago, if not longer, but that Where video, none of this shit was I, documented. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I still show people that video. I'm like, yo, how lit is that? I showed my girlfriend the other day. She's like very much not into death metal. So like, I'll just show her shit. And I'll be like, yo, isn't this fucking sick? And like, sometimes she'll be like, yeah. Other times she'll be like, ah, I don't really get it. Or like I show, <laughs> I showed her this band the other day. Uh, I believe it's pronounced Nithing or Nithing. It's the drummer from Vitriol's uh, solo project. And it's like, they put a, he put out a record last year called Agonal Hymns. I'm totally plugging this. It's like, crazy fucking death metal record so i put on a song for my girlfriend i'm like yo isn't this fucking sick and it just sounds like i realized to like the naked <laughs> ear it sounds like you're listening to a toilet but to me i'm just like this is fucking insane and my girlfriend's just like staring at my phone like this just sounds mean is i think what she said to me <laughs> it was sick though it was just very honest and cute and i was like hell yeah but we still listen to that shit in the car when I'm driving. Uh, <laughs> it's an acclimate. You got to acclimate your your musical palate just as much as with beer. If I were to sip on th this for the first time, let's say, I don't forget how old I am, over 20, 25 years ago, I, I probably wouldn't enjoy it. But today I'm, I'm loving it. So, so who knows where she'll be at in the next few years? She'll be showing you shit. Exactly. Well, she already does. She looks, she's a big R&B fan and I'm a huge R&B fan too. So she shows me all these like sick ass artists that I've never heard of and all of these songs where I'm just like, how have I gone so many years and this never just like yes. crossed my path. And uh, it's cool to be able to connect on that level. And then and expanding your, your musical catalog. Yeah. I also have to remember, though, there's not a lot of people that just are like R&B and death metal. You know what I mean? Like, it's very, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, that doesn't always go hand in hand, I guess. I loved uh, Cheney Crab from Entios uh, put a post out the other day saying, uh, all you people that like... Um it's about Sleep Token. All these people that like Sleep Token, you probably like our secret IRB fans. She's. I saw that status, too. I completely agree with her. She's, she's definitely <laughs> right. Those bands, that band, like... Fuck. I like, I am low key. I do fuck with some sleep token songs. Oh, me too. Uh, I've liked them for yeah. a long time. There's no shame yeah, there. Same. They're very popular. Same. There's nothing wrong with liking popular bands, people. Let's get over right. that. I just don't, you know, it's like people are like, well, what do you think about this band? Like it's supposed to have some yes. profound, you know, because they're popular, we're not allowed to yeah. like them anymore. That's, that's silly. right. Exactly. Yeah. I think that band's sick. We um, like what we like and we don't like what we don't like. And that's that. Yeah. And she's totally right. They had a single, I don't remember what the song's called, but they had a single on this newest album that was like a straight up R&B song. And it was my favorite, my favorite song. I think it's. I'm not going to look it up now. I'll <laughs> mention it later somewhere. We'll but yeah, it's a sick song. People it's my favorite song on that record. record. You try to figure out what Jason's talking yeah, about. Yeah, you figure it out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so here you are. You, you, you've gone through, you know, Warforge took off, is working super well. You you're toured with yeah. us. Um, yeah. Extremely eclectic, heavy, all over the place. Gore gutsy, ulcerate, makes you feel uncomfortable. And then now you feel the need to start something new called Spent Case. Talk to me about this this oh, extra time yeah. you have to, to start a new project that's much more hardcore, much more, I listened to a few tracks you sent to me, much more straight up, let's say. Definitely. Um, well, Spent Case kind of came out of uh, a few friends of mine from over here. They play uh, Vince and Tim. Shout out Vince and Tim. I love you guys. They play guitar in a really cool hardcore band from here called Bovice. Shout out Bovice as well. Um, and I've just been friends with those guys for a really long time. They're some of my favorite people that just play shows in the Chicago community. And they're just very good hearted people. Um, and Vince and I had kind of been fucking around on music in the past, but never really like found anything that clicked right away. Um, and then over the summer, actually it was before our tour, 
Vince hit me up one day and he's like, yo, you should just come by my house and like bring your kid and let's just jam on some shit. And him and Tim, their other guitar player were there. I brought over my drum kit and like, lo and behold, we wrote two songs in a day. And it was like, yeah, it was just really quick. Like a sign. There's something's working. Like, cause we all decided that we were like, we're all good at playing heavy music. Let's try and do something heavy. And like, like you said, Warforged. Is a very eclectic, experimental, like lots of thought put into the music type of band that it kind of felt cool. To, there's to no just, two I, songs. Off, there's no two songs written in one day of Warforged. Right. Exactly. No, there's like <laughs> months of fucking yeah. like looming and illuminating <laughs> over it and just wondering, is this good? Is this the right thing? <laughs> like, spend cases more just like mean, pissed, let's go. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it just, it just started as uh, like, I like hardcore a lot and I've never really had a foot into that scene specifically. Um, and I had mentioned to them that I wanted to do something heavy and they also always like doing heavy music. So we kind of came up with this like death metal, hardcore fusion thing. It's like, I'll just play crazy ass blasts over like a heavy part or something like that. And it was just clicking so well in the room together. And it was so much fun that like, we just decided like, well, let's try and make this a thing. And it, the ball just kept rolling. Like we wrote like five, four songs or five songs before I left for the tour with you guys. And literally the second week on tour in our little band group chat, we had a show offer like five days after we got back from the Cryptops really? tour. I was like, fuck it. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm down. Like they were like, oh, Jason, will you be down? Like you're just getting home from tour. I'm like, yes, I'll be in good playing shape. Like yeah. the material yeah. is a little easier on drums than Warforged per se. Um, but yeah, it was just like, it was a blast. Um Getting home and then playing those songs with those guys was a blast. We played a show at this venue called The D in Gary, Indiana, Ooh, which is not the, the scariest yeah. city in, in Michigan, right? In Indiana? In Indiana, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's one of them. I've been, yeah, it, it's, yeah, I'm not going to, no comment because I feel like a lot of Chicago just like gener- like directs hate on Indiana in general and I will not be that person, but. <laughs> it's just a memory from the, when we drove to do that, that with that Mara, that death fest that I did we, we drove through Gary and for some reason it's, it's stuck with me all these years oh, yeah. that it had it's the highest like, murder capita at that time. But this is like 20 years ago at this point. Hell yeah. Spend case stuff is awesome. Like it started to turn into this thing that was more of a hardcore combined with death metal thing. We wrote all these songs. We booked some studio time. We actually just recorded what I sent you is our EP that we recorded with Andy Nelson, who plays guitar in uh, Weekend Nachos, a, a big power violence band from here. Um, and he works at Bricktop Recordings. Great studio. That was my first time working with Andy and he's a genius. He is. He's so good at what he does. And it was the most comfortable recording. One of the most comfortable recording sessions I've ever had. I've had some very comfortable ones, but I've knocked out drums in like a day, which made me feel like accomplished. Hell <laughs> and yes, uh, congrats. I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm just really excited about it. Like I like, like Warforged, is, it's kind of nice to be Warforged. I look at Warforged in a way where the, the, what I feel like is my main inspiration behind it are artists like Radiohead or the 1975 or Brockhampton or even King Crimson in a sense where you see these artists really take the music to be a reflection of themselves. And every song doesn't sound like the same band. Like I like that us as Warforged have been able to kind of progress in a way where we could really do whatever the fuck we want to do. Like we, we can, and we can't like we can people will might not like it, but I feel like once you kind of realize what makes you the happiest with making music. And for me, it's always been, having total creative expression of saying what we need to say, especially with like Warforged and the record we're working on now. Like um, it's very different. Uh, It's kind of all over the place as far as the sound goes, but I couldn't be more stoked on how it's turning out. Um, And having spent case be more of a like, Hey, we're doing these couple of things. We're going to keep it in, in house with this. And the fact that like, like Warforged, we write a lot on our own, come together, combine it together, work on it together. Spent case, it's like all in the room shit. We write all the songs in the room. I feel like when you write music in the room with guys and it sounds banging, you know, live, it's going to fucking crush. Oh, hell yeah. Like if it sounds sick in the room, it's going to sound insane in front of people. That's true. So it's like, I feel like that's kind of the philosophy, but philosophy as far as how we've written music with spent case, like just making it sound as sick as fuck as we can in the room. And then the, the recordings have been sounding huge. So yeah, um, it's been, a it's been a lot of fun. We have, uh, I don't know when uh, it's not announced yet. I don't even know when it's getting announced, but we do have some gigs coming up. Uh, the record, the, our EP will hopefully be out this year. Um, we're currently 
trying to shop it around, see if anybody wants to help us put it out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And there was a long time where I didn't, where I, I kind of felt that like I could only do Warforged because it's such a pure, honest concentration of like my feelings and emotions in a lot of the songs and the other guys as well. Um, and I felt like that was like my only identity with music, but having spent case being another option for me and just like another like side of things. And like, it, it's, it's just like, I probably like the listener or the average person. It doesn't sound like that far off. It's like heavy music, heavy music. But like once you're in it, you play hardcore oh, yeah. shows. It's so different from death metal. Like kids fucking flying everywhere, beating the shit out of each other, jumping off stage. It's awesome. I love it. Like, it makes me like think I'm like, why aren't death metal guys fucking losing their shit all the time? Like the music we're is too reserved. just like we're, 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 yeah, we're exactly. analyzing and judging you. But it's like, imagine seeing somebody gets fucking spin kicked in the head at a deicide show. It would probably be <laughs> it's violent and I'm not encouraging that behavior. I'm just saying I would see that and be like, yo, this is fucking sick. This is Let's heavy go. As shit. And that's what I like about hardcore. It's, it's just very like primal on the nose. Yeah, very primal. I like that a lot. And sometimes I think that like that could get lost in the sauce with music these days. So it's kind of cool to see more of like an honest approach. Honestly, like one of my big influences for that kind of style was listening to albums like Whisper Supremacy and and Then You'll Beg, like with like Mike's vocal style and stuff like that at the time. Like I remember being like, this is so fucking sick. And those were like those were some of the first Cryptopsy records I had heard. So I was fucking on board, but I'm a cryptopsy stan. Let's be fucking real here. So <laughs> I I can appreciate every record. Well, thank you for all that. Back to, to Warforge writing new material, and you're saying everyone works on their own and then comes back together. How does that work? Because you guys are all so different. And, and <laughs> <laughs> It works chaotically speaking. I would say, like... Um, the way we've kind of worked on music, like, and I'm all with Warforged, I'm always trying to challenge us. Like after we do this record, I do want us to try and write music in a room together to see how it would go as opposed to being more of like, we used all the software to do all this shit, which is cool. It's, it's awesome. And I don't knock anything like that, but yeah, with Warforged, it's sort of like Alex is a big creative proponent and the Alex is like, I will say this right now, Alex Damsky, I totally believe in this lifetime is like my creative kindred spirit. Like it got to this point where once Adrian had left the band um, after voice and his creative input wasn't involved anymore. Once Alex and I kind of clicked on a lot of ideas, it was just like, now it's like we just get high as fuck and we'll call each other and be like, yo, isn't this fucking sick? <laughs> and it's like my favorite thing in the world. Cause like, I honestly think the dude is a fucking genius. He is so good at everything that he does with music that it's like, and he's so capable of doing so much different stuff. So he's like, he writes a ton of the shit and he'll throw it to me. And he'll be like, what do you think about this? And then we'll work on it together. Um, but honestly, like Jace has been writing riffs. Max has been writing full songs. Like everybody kind of like what we do is like, we pitch out like a demo. Usually the guys will make like a pre-production demo, Alex or Max or Jace. They'll send it to the group. We'll kind of all ruminate on it. Um, we'll make changes. If we feel like there's changes necessary, we'll, we'll comment on how we feel about the song. Sometimes songs go through big facelifts that way to make it more workable. Other times, some of those songs just stay exactly the way they were in the pre-production stage where it's like we're keeping it to this kind of uh, on this kind of level instead of adding more to it or taking away from it. Um, but, yeah, I would say that the creative process is sort of at least like for Sundial and the record we're working on now has been that same kind of vibe, I would say. I just want what we do after to be I know if we take a different approach we'll have a different result. And that's kind of what I want to try doing more with Warforged. Cause for me, it's like what keeps music from going stale in general is just is, is challenge challenging myself on a creative level. So if I could keep doing that and finding different ways to come out with different outputs of music, like I want to keep it that way personally. Um, but we'll see. I never know what the future holds. And I know that right now, like, the songs that we're working on, like this record, we've been working on it for a while um, and we keep getting like, you know, we get the Cryptopsy offer and it's the like, tours, who the fuck yeah. is going to say exactly. no to that? Yeah. So we put it on the back burner for touring and that stuff like all that. The time. People don't get that. Like you write, there's two modes in a musician's brain and it's yeah. writing mode and then getting into shape to play show mode. Exactly. And they both and take time. They both do take time. And we're a band that really needs to focus on one or the other because when we try to do both, <laughs> it's too. just like everything just kind of like. It's it's definitely difficult to do that, but like maybe one day, I don't know. I, I mean, right now it's kind of the way it works is like we do one or the other, but 
the stuff that we're working on now, the songs we're working on now, I think are like probably like, I don't know. Somebody would argue it. That's like an old Warforged fan or something like that, maybe. But like, I think they're our most creative songs that we've come up with to date. Um, I think that they're the most different that we've ever done. And I just want to try and keep challenging ourselves in that regard. I think it's cool. Um, it's cool that you're like challenging your fans at the same time because oh yeah, you have fans that appreciate each record. And then there's fans that probably have favorites. But as yep. you keep creating more and more uh, music for them to to explore and to listen to, um, they will they they're going to understand your musical identity is an evolving creature, such as Rivers of Nile. Exactly. Yeah, exa perfect example. You know, and we've been homies with those dudes. Like they they've been like vetting for us as a band for like over ten years now. Like they took us on our first full U.S. tour before you guys did. Um, they've, they've always like put our name in front of so many people and like, they're just, uh, they're really like sweet gentlemen that they're just awesome dudes. They're awesome. Oh, yeah. and we're lucky them. to be able to yeah. call them friends and shit like that. Like, it's cool to see that. But yeah, it's, it's just sort of like, I feel like once you shed this idea of like, we can only sound like one thing, once you break that, like the options are endless. That's and really like, cool. And I, I, I felt that is, watching you guys and I'm sure you guys like. Pulled out the bangers because you're opening for Cryptopsy, but... Oh, yeah, we pulled out the bangers. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I would have pulled out the bangers. But I know you guys yeah. have a lot more eclectic, smoother stuff, too, that you could pull out if you toured with, like, um, Between the Barrier to Me or something like that. Yeah, there's a <laughs> there's a funny story. We uh, Before we toured with you guys last year, we did a, this quick run with Through the Eyes of the Dead in yes. June. It was, like, yeah. 10 shows. And we played Sheridan Road, which is a song that opens with this, like, big clean singing section. And, like... It was always such a fucking hit or miss. Like I remember we played Come and Take It Live on that tour. Yeah. And there were two like there was one guy that was like his mind was blown. He was like, This is sick. And then there was another guy. I just saw him shaking his head like Nope. And he walked away. Really? He walked away. <laughs> it was so it was like hard not to laugh in the fucking moment. But it's just like, you know, yeah, it's not it's everything's not gonna be for everybody and that's okay. You know what that's I mean? So it's like funny. people I'm I'm grateful that anybody gives a sh fuck about our band remotely in general, you know? And I always will be grateful for that. Like, you know, I think that there are people that understand we're gonna do what we want to do as a band. Um, I think there's some people that are always gonna want a certain sound from us, which is okay too. Uh, you know, that's just such as life. Well, the, I feel the good like news, when you're... people, if they want that certain sound is that they you have that album already. So you can just listen yes. to it again. I tell people that all the time. I tell people that all the fucking time where I'm just like, yo, why don't you just go and listen to that then? If that's what um, you like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I, I don't know. I feel like music evolves kind of like what you said, like people do, like we change, people change over yeah. the years, like things become different. And I feel like imagine I being cannibal at, corpse and having to still make the same record. <laughs> yeah. They still bang it though. They do. I love they that do. new cannibal no, no, record. Me too. They do. But um, I imagine th th them as artists hypothetically might be somewhere else by now. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, fuck it. You know, George corpse grinder he's going to sea world and getting best. sick ass stuffed animals. Yeah. He's the shit. Like I love that band. I mean, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do really think that like, like I look at our record, our record sometimes as kind of like a snapshot of where we're all at in our lives. And I love that because it's just like, what more permanent history can you create than art? Like, um, and it's just kind of like, like this, this record we're working on now has a lot of like, it was definitely, I would say it's been a challenge to like, I've challenged myself to be a lot more vulnerable lyrically on this album. Um, and I think it kind of pulled that out of the other guys too. And I'm at this point where we've kind of been, I, I, we've had these songs written for a while now and I listen to them and there's parts in my head where I'm like, Ooh, was this like, was this a good idea to write the song about something terrible that happened in my life? It and is. then it like brings it you back there. It is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could be, but like there's sometimes I look at those songs too and I'm like, I'm so glad I got it out there. Like, yeah. this. you know, art, um, art is cathartic. So yeah, get it out there. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's like picking a scab. Which we're not supposed exactly. to do. We're not supposed to do yeah. that. <laughs> right. But it's life. And we're it, we're humans with impulses yeah. and feelings and, you know, motivations to do all kinds of things. So I'm just thankful for all the fucking people that still fuck with our band and still like our new stuff and are still excited to hear it. Like even like you mentioned, Chaney, Crab and Naveen have been like pretty big and not big advocates for us, but they're awesome. They put us on our podcast a while ago uh, on their podcast. Um, they've always been super kind to us and very encouraging of the band. And they've always just been like 
saying nice things like they like how creative we are. And it's like to hear that from like people like you guys and people like Entheos, it's such a validating feeling when you work on this shit for so long and you're like, does anybody even give a shit? And then like Uh, somebody that's like, like I remember meeting you for the first time in tour on tour with Black Crown Initiate in 2019, yes. and I made you take a picture with me because my <laughs> mind was blown. You were like, "I like your record," and I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> like I remember after that show, I was just like, "You guys don't get it." Like, <laughs> like just telling everybody I how that I night. was. Yeah, it was awesome though, and like, <laughs> yeah, I do it was, remember it that. Was, that was it was fun. very cool. That was a fun show. It was a that was a fun tour, and like. Montreal rules. I wish I could play there once a month. Oh hell yes! That that last or show more. was incredible. So yeah, it was much bonkers, fun. dude. Just craziness. Yeah. I have a bunch more questions, but I know that the Thirsty Thursday gang has questions as well. I'm going to open up the floor now. If any of you here would like to ask Jason a question, raise your digital hand. I will uh, ask you to talk, and then we'll move from there. Phil Dervitas from the Whispers from the Void podcast, part of the Vox and Hops album review crew. Uh, a wonderful human is here, and uh, he's got the first question. Anyway, hi, Jason. Hi. How are you? I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm pretty good, pretty good. Uh, my question is, uh, as a drummer, like I want to to get on drums one day for sure. And what is like your tips for beginning as a drummer? Because like you said earlier, like you did it like very on your own, no course or anything. So what is like your tips or uh, advice that you can give for someone like me who want to try drums? I would say uh, as far as my advice goes, I would say... Um, it's interesting when we have like people like us have a background in heavy music already in extreme drumming. I feel like a lot of people that want to take on the mantle of extreme drumming want to hit blast beats right away and things like that right away. My biggest advice though would be learn your fundamentals first. Go look up some YouTube videos on your basic rudiments like paradiddles, double paradiddles, anything like that's that's good to get your hands warming up and your feet warming up because you could do exercises like that on all of your limbs. And I feel like Starting slow, practicing steadily, give yourself some time to practice every day, even if it's just on a practice pad, like, and you keep working on your warm ups and routines and listening to things like you will gradually just get better and better the more work you put into it. Um, but I would say for, yeah, the beginners, like don't start slow. Don't put too much on yourself because I feel like it could be a lot to be like, oh, I want to hit 280 beats per minute right off the bat. And I don't know how to play like a Beatles song on the drum kit. Like, <laughs> you know, think about yeah, I know it's like it's, the it's, basics. Yeah. It, it's, it's silly to say it like that. I know, but I do really think that it's so important to learn the basics. Like I learned drums playing like, you know, green day songs are not nearly as hard as a fucking behemoth song, like playing wise. Um, you know, music like that, like Blink-182, big influence on me as a kid, especially Travis Barker. But like even him, like you listen to some of his shit and it's just like, what are you doing, dude? You are ripping over these songs. Like I would listen to that shit and have to stunt myself and be like, all right, listen. I mean, I didn't talk to myself like this when I was like 12 and being like, listen, kid, you're 12 years old. You can't play like Travis. I never said like, but I, I remember thinking like, you know, it takes work to get there. I still probably can't play like that, dude, but. Yeah, I would say just start off slow, learn some basic rudiments, keep practicing, and then eventually, like, it'll start coming to you more naturally than not. And when you feel more comfortable, don't be afraid to push it a little bit more. Bring up those tempos on your warm-ups. Bring up the speed on everything that you do if that's that's kind of the drumming angle that you want to take with it. Um, and, yeah, and don't be afraid of, like... Don't try not to be discouraged if you can't hit your goal right away. As long as you keep working at it and keep and keep dedicating some time to it, like you will get there. The time and the work will pay off. Like if my dumb ass can do everything I've done with drums so far in my life, I truly believe anybody can probably fucking do it. So that's why I'm always like start slow and then you will get there. I, I, I used to teach drums like a long time ago and it's so unconventional because I don't know how to read music or like anything on a professional level. But like I taught a kid, I taught this dude. Um, I won't put his name on here, but this guy hit me up. He saw Warforged open a bunch of local shows before we were even touring. He was a big fan of my drumming and he hit me up about lessons. And a couple months later, the dude was blast beating like clean and not like at the craziest tempos, but still like he was getting a grip on it. And I was like, Oh fuck, I could like, 
it was kind of like a double edged moment where he was like, I could do this. And I was like, I could teach you how to do this. Like that's fucking insane. So that's my, but yeah, anyway, that's my long answer to that question. <laughs> that is perfect. Thank you for your answer. And for sure. I want, I want to try drums for, for sure. In, well, hell yeah. uh, in the near future. Hell yeah. Well, hit me up anytime. If you need any tips, my man. Thank you. Of course. Hell yes, I love that. And cheers to Phil and the the Whispers from the Void podcast. Mike Neely, you're up next. Hey, Jason. How you doing, buddy? What up, my man? How you doing, dude? Good, man. Uh, how was your, First of all, how was your first time in Vegas? Lit. It was fucking awesome. Well, it was really hot, if I'm being honest with you. Um, yeah. It was <laughs> very fucking hot that day. Uh, but it was fun. It was a cool show. That venue was very cool. Like, uh, what, Backstage Billiards? Backstage I think it was called. Billiards, yeah. Yeah. It was sick. Triple it was, a, it was like, <laughs> honestly, like it was a sick, <laughs> she's saying, yeah, Alex remembers. I know Alex remembers like all the fucking like, yeah, it was, you, a, it was a it good night easy, for Warforge. It was, yeah, it was a good night for Warforge. I, honestly, my favorite parts were our bass player, Alex was like wild and out on the old strip. He was like, yeah, everybody remembers this. He was just like screaming like, fuck. At the top of his lungs, because it was like he was like, "Yo, this place is like, like desolate, but also a tourist trap at the same time." So he's like, "I'm just gonna scare everybody." And then like he was like texting me, he's like, "Yo," he was like, he was like, "Chris and Dom from Cryptopsy saw me like yelling, and they thought it was funny, so I've been doing it more." And I'm just like, "Hell yeah, keep it going, act like a psycho." Um, that was probably my favorite part about that day, to be honest with you. And there's he's still got a reel on his Instagram of that, and it's like one of my favorite videos to this day. But yeah, Vegas was cool. Vegas was very much, I could see like, it's got to be wild living there because you have to be so used to it. I'm, I'm assuming, or at least you probably get more used to it. You must avoid but it's kind of, everything. You must never go yes. where people are. Yes. It, basically. Yeah, like, it, like he hit it on the head there. I don't live like very close downtown. I live like more Southeast, like. Uh, just before Vegas turns into Henderson. So I avoid, I avoid a lot of the chaos, thankfully. Um, but it, it the, we're getting more venues that are, it's, we have more choices now. Cause usually it is either triple B's or the Fremont stage, which is the same building essentially, or it'll be at the smaller venues in Henderson, like Eagle Erie or an American Legion uh, just off the strip. Uh, but now we're getting more venues. So it's, you know, that triple B's is fun. It's I've been there so many fucking times. It's 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 getting old, but it's still a good venue. It's been around for a while. Um, but uh, but I did have an actual question. Uh, so obviously comparing voice to the newer album, the the vibe is very different. Obviously, voice is very melancholy and kind and really morose and just dark sounding. And then uh, and obviously the newer record, like I, we had this conversation before, where you were saying like you're you're exploring more emotions than just the uh, the fear aspect. Uh, so I guess my question would be. Uh, the uh, albums that you listen to, uh, I imagine your influences were kind of different compared to the two uh, vibes in both the albums. Uh, what were you listening to differently compared to uh, one or the other? Honestly, with so like for for voice, I mean, that being like our first record, I feel like it was a big concentration of like the more dissonant style of metal that we all like bands like Ulcerate, Gore Guts, Portal, uh, more dark stuff along those lines. Like you said, music that's more based in fear and like having a scary element to it. Um, I think that was definitely what we were going for with voice. And that was more of like what we were all into at the time, especially cause that shit was like popping off. Like as when like ulcerate was putting out vermis and shit like that. And like Gore guts was coming back with colored sands and shit like that. It seemed like it was a very like prominent thing. And we all fucked with bands like that. So voice kind of came and, and voice was also, it's like a very, it was a very meticulous record to make. It took us a long fucking time oh, it sounds to do like that it. record. Yeah. Just like and listening to it from start to finish. Like it was, that album was made as an album. I don't know if definitely. that makes sense. Like it oh, doesn't, it, does. yeah. it doesn't sound like a collection of songs. There's, there is a whole, there's a whole journey. Through right, that exactly. It's a concept record. And we knew yeah. we wanted it to be like this overarching thing as opposed to like the opposite, which Sundial is literally the intention is to be what you just said, a collection of songs. Um, the influence for Sundial uh, was sort of the idea of just stripping back and doing the exact opposite of voice, pretty much. Um, voice took so much time to make because it's such a meticulous record that 
we all just wanted to do something different. We all wanted to just do something that was more like, let's just be a fucking band and write songs that we like get behind. And I was like, I still love these records, but like I was listening to albums like, like Ginger by Brockhampton and Notes on a Conditional Form by the 1975, where like you hear these records that are huge. They have all these different sounds to them, all these different layers to them. Um, and it kind of like, set us up for this like i mean at least it set me up creatively speaking to try and think of it in a way where it's like oh you know we don't like the scary stuff was kind of like we explored that vibe so much on voice that i had almost felt like if we were going to do it again on sundial it might even come off as ingenuine so that's why i was kind of like let's not like force something if we're not feeling like writing that um but that being said I realize how many people love that sound and I love that sound too on our new record. There's definitely some songs that are much more along those lines, I would say as well as songs that like sound different from voice and sundial. Um, but yeah, I would say that the, I kind of missed the idea of having a record where it's like, you could pick it up and do whatever you want with it. You want to listen to the first half. Like voice is like an album where I feel like, and a lot of people have always told me like, you need to listen to it front to back. And like, it's kind of does make sense if you're trying to like, grasp the entire thing but that's like a daunting task it's a long record there's a lot of like dark heavy shit going on i think with sundial the idea was just to kind of be like hey you could listen to any songs on these record and on this record in any order you want at any given time like you want to listen to half of it great you want to listen to two songs great um i just want i think we just wanted it to be a little bit more digestible but it's funny because like when voice came out everybody was like this record's insane and dense and like we don't know how to approach it. And then Sondial comes out and they're like, this isn't insane and dense. And I'm like, motherfuckers, what do you want? Like, <laughs> what do you want me to do? You know? <laughs> but yeah. I, and I guess both kinds of albums have their qualities, you know, like, like voice is obviously like, it's like a movie essentially. It's like, it's like if you were to watch like pineapple express versus fucking the revenant, you know? Yeah. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But you put pineapple express is still fun. Like you can still right. pick it up wherever and it's still a fun time. So yeah, I, I, it, it, in my opinion, bo both kinds of albums definitely have their qualities and they, and they hit the mark. They, they, they hit their own marks pretty, pretty efficiently. I think. Thank you, homie. Appreciate it. Of course, buddy. Hell yeah. Well, hell fucking yes. Thank you so, so much. Appreciate that, Mike. Uh, up next, we have a tour mate, uh, Alexandra. She was, she was, uh, out on the road with us, uh, she was doing merch, she was taking pictures, she was doing videos. She was uh, very helpful and lots of fun. Um, hi. Yeah, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say hi. Uh, hi. Like, I, didn't, I, I didn't say bye to either of you guys on that tour. I just did like an Irish goodbye. Uh, Matt knows why I kind of didn't say anything to anyone. Cause, cause but, some, some, some people um, in Montreal suck. Yeah, some people in Montreal suck. Um, but yeah, Jason, I just wanted to say hi. Hi. Um, I don't have a question, but I did when you were um, talking about that show at the Congress Theater, that uh, Battle of the Bands, I am 1000% positive that I was there. Um, really? Yeah. My first How old show? Are, you, Jason? are we? We're the same age, right? Like round. I'm you... 32. Okay. Yeah. We are definitely. Yeah. Because you said you were 14, 15. Yeah, I was 15 yep. when we did 14 yeah, or 15. We were there. Damn. That's, that's crazy. so crazy. That is Small fucking nuts. That's so crazy. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. That's sick. That's wild. Yeah. That's all. Hell also, yeah. I just had some of that hot sauce. It's really good still. Um, Ooh, you I guys, almost finished you... mine. I meant to bring it up, actually. I almost finished I almost finished the <laughs> carrot one. Yeah. Hell it's yeah. Like, it's like halfway gone, so I've been milking it a little bit. But are you guys going to do any more? Probably like that item has been so fucking like a hit and I didn't think like I had no idea it would be. And like Jace, our guitar player is like, he's a big proponent of the hot sauce. He kind of like runs that whole game and he's so good at it that I'm like, yo, keep doing what you do. Cause like people love it. Like we sell it a shitload. Um, like we, we did two hot sauce. The first time we did it was on a tour with rivers of Nile in 2022. We did two hot sauces and we did a small order and they sold out within like the first week of tour. So we ordered more for the second time around and we still have, I think there's still some up in our web store if you want to pick it up. Um, but I'm glad you fuck with it. And yeah, I think we will probably be doing stuff like that in the future. Um, luckily the guys at soothsayer sauce who are from, they're from based in Chicago. Like, they like our band a lot and they've always been really cool about it. So yeah, I hope we can continue to keep doing them and coming up with some crazy ass shit. Jace already has ideas for like other types of hot sauces. He wants to try and work with them. Like we were talking about um, just coming up with a recipe from scratch with them too, which could be cool. 
Nice. That's all I had. Delicious. Well, it was good to see you. Great to it was see you. It's nice seeing you too. I miss you guys. Hopefully, I'll yeah. see you guys soon. Hopefully. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Up next, we got Peter from Half. Hail Half. Hey, Jason. What's up, homie? What's up, my man? How you doing? I'm good. How you doing, dude? I'm doing good. You probably just got back from tour, right? Yeah, like two days ago. <laughs> Hell yeah. Was it sick? It was awesome. I'm not, yeah. I'm not recovered yet. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so on, on the bat, bat of that, back of that, I have a new tour related question I want to ask anyone coming through. You just finished playing Dallas. You have a 16 hour ride to Phoenix that you have to do overnight. What's on the the uh van's radio to keep Bro. you awake all night? Oh my god. First off, this is what I like to call demon time. <laughs> so this is where Alex and I shine and we're just like, let's fucking get nuts. So like It'll be a handful of things like recently on that last tour with, uh, yeah, see, Ryan knows demon time, boy. So on that last tour we did with Cryptopsy, all the overnight, where there was a handful of overnight drives. I usually do them all um, or most of them. Usually the thing I'll like, I'll drive from like 11 to like seven or eight if I can hang that long. And then Max will take over. Um, but I'll listen, like, it depends on the vibe. If Alex is up with me all night, we just listen to fucked up shit where it's like, I'll put on like a Jesse Ventura on a podcast like now, like in current times and just hear him like ramble about crazy ass sick shit. <laughs> or uh, sometimes we'll just listen to like we were doing this thing where we were trying to listen to like creepy pastas narrated on YouTube. But they're so fucking bad when you have to hear some dude with like a fake British accent, like narrating these. Like it's like, oh, man, maybe these are better to just read and not listen to. Um but it's always a handful of shit. It's usually not metal stuff super late at night. Normally it's a lot of hip hop R and B or like vaporwave or like, I like listening. I like looking up hip hop and R and B songs slowed and reverbed on YouTube. I have a whole playlist of like songs that I think sound more banging than they do slowed and reverbed than regular. So like at regular speed. So I'll put that on sometimes when we're doing night drives. Um, but it, de it depends on the vibe. Depends if everybody's sleeping. I'm not going to put on like deicide or something scary. Um, sometimes if I'm really struggling to stay awake, podcasts help the best because I feel like I'm involved in some type of conversation. Um, but yeah, it's, it's usually a mixed bag of things, but I would say like, uh, for the most part, it's usually Alex and I trying to find ways to entertain each other through the music or through like a podcast or a video or something like that. Did you guys have to do that drive, a 16-hour drive from Phoenix to from California or whatever the fuck? Yeah, it fucking sucked. <laughs> I couldn't do it twice. <laughs> that is fucking brutal, dude. That's horrible. Yeah. Well, uh, Who did it? How did you guys do it? Did you guys, like, trade off? Uh, I'm I'm a giant wuss. I'm the first to go to sleep, but I'll be awake at 6 a.m. to start yeah. driving. Uh, oh, yeah. Frank and AJ, they do the night drives, and they'll listen to, like, the entire Pink Floyd discography nightly. That's lit. That's yeah. like deep shit, though. That's like if I want to search through my soul while I'm driving at like yeah. 6 a.m. And sometimes I'm like, I can't handle this emotional like <laughs> like entailment that I'm going to go through if I'm fucking listening to a Pink Floyd's discography Dude, driving it, in the middle of like it's nowhere. wild when you wake up in the pitch black and it's the end of Dark Side and it's just that like vocal <laughs> wailing. You're just yeah. like, where the fuck am I? <laughs> yeah, God, dude, that has got to be fucking insane. Or the last song on metal, which gets yeah. really weird. Yes. Like, that's got to be nuts. Dude, some of those like <laughs> more psychedelic Pink Floyd records, like their older shit. It's just so like, what the fuck were you guys thinking when drugs. you wrote this? Don't like, think about drugs. So wild. Yeah, drugs, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's sick that they're just like, drugs. But like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's definitely different. It's not like how Body Box's singer is like, I deal coke and shit publicly. But like, uh, <laughs> not like that. It's like a different type of thing. Like the whole Sid Barrett story and all that shit. God damn. Um, I'm calling the episode Demon Time, by the way. <laughs> ha, let's go. Hell yeah. Perfect. Nadine, you're up. Go for it. Unmute yourself and ask your question to Jason. Oh, shit. Hi. Hi. How are you, What's kid? What's up, dude? Oh, kid. <laughs> How, <laughs> How you doing, older kid? Are you, kid? <laughs> I know. <laughs> How you doing? I'm so good. It's so good to see you. Yeah, I, like, it's good to see you too. Thank you for I'm joining. I'm blown away. I'm blo yeah, I'm blown away. You had a like a beer named after you. Yeah, I didn't tell you this. I thought you we talked about this. You didn't tell me that. Oh shit! I'm sorry. Well, no, here it okay. is. Yeah, there it is. That's uh, that's so cool, dude. So, yeah, 
I have so many questions, but like these are normally questions that I would ask like on the phone with you. Cause like Jason and I are like, <laughs> yeah, we we're call, homies. We, we, we homies. Like we call each other yeah. to be like, guess what? I'm in love. Or like, <laughs> yeah. <you know>. Yeah. <laughs> Very sick. Yeah. No, I know a lot about you, you as a person, like outside of your music. And I guess my question is like, how do you incorporate this? Cause like, I know you're in a new relationship and I'm just like, so curious to hear if that's going to come out in the new album. Uh, prop. Well, the music that we wrote on the new album was before I met my current significant other, but like, yeah, I've already like, I ain't going to lie. I've already written like five songs based on that were the lyrics. Um, so there will probably be some down the line. We're like, Honestly, not to give, I don't want to like give too much away because we're working on a record that's not even out yet. But I think part of the plan is that we kind of want, I kind of want us to do something where we challenge ourselves to write something more on a single link where it's more like, hey, this is the idea. We're not going to like throw everything in the mix. We're going for a few specific things. And one of those themes is love. And it's, it's love and like the positives of it, the negatives of it, what it does. Like, but in, I'm trying to deliver it more of like, a different way, I guess. And we'll see how it comes out. But yeah, there will definitely be, I think a handful of that in the mix with this for sure, without a doubt. Yeah, so there's cool. going to be your bath. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and like my other question is, I think I've, I've known you since just like, since right before I think essence of the land came out. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. That's yeah. so crazy. I know that is yeah. fucking insane. That's 10 years. 10 over 10 years. Years. yeah over it's 10, 10 years. years this 10 year it's 10 years yeah right january right in january mm -hmm. yeah yeah and how would you say i mean i know there have been so many changes in the band some of the in personnel and like how would you how would you describe the evolution oh my god i don't so much just like oh i don't even I, like it just feels like night. It feels so different. Like us as a band now just feels so different from back then. I think back then there was a lot of just like, uh, I mean, it was great. It was cool back then. It was exciting in a different way because we were just kind of getting our feet wet with like a sound. I feel like essence was definitely more of like a unifying piece where we were like, Hey, this is like who we are as a band establishing it, establishing the lineup. Um, and now I'm yeah, the different, that's such a hard question to answer. It's so different. Like, I don't think, like, lyrically speaking, I don't think I could write songs like that at this point in my life. I probably could. I don't feel like I have the desire to because I feel like be, before, between then and now, I've grown personally and creatively at least. I've grown to find more of an appreciation and reflecting real life through music, real life experiences, like things I could connect to. The thing that I, I feel like was missing for metal from me for not everybody, not every artist or everything like this, but sometimes I just feel like I couldn't connect to the lyrics. I don't murder people. Like, you know, I'm not like, I don't see any demons or shit like that. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not knocking any of it, but it's sort of like, I've always felt like there's a part of it where like, I was always more interested in the instrumentation behind it as opposed to like, maybe the message that these bands are bands are sending out. Not that I knock any of it. I think it's sick if you want to write about like ripping people's heads off and shit. But I think um, the biggest difference I would say like between then and now the evolution is becoming more of a band that's like, Hey, let's challenge ourselves to be more honest about music as far as who we are as people. Like let's be more honest about that in our music as opposed to when we were first starting with essence, it was always about like, let's come up with a concept. Let's come up with this idea. Let's ruminate on it and work on it for a really long time before we're ready to get it. Um, I just think with the guys that change and especially when you're in a band where it's like guys are coming in and coming out, that identity is always going to change depending on who is in your band. So I feel like maybe the biggest, like one of the biggest evolutionary jumps too was just being able to embrace that as opposed to this idea of like Warforge started as this one thing and has, it has to continue to be this one thing. Like it's never been like that. And I'm, I'm glad it hasn't because I feel like it would be harder to be a band if that was the case for us. Cause then it's like, Oh, I'm just trying to write shit. I wrote, we wrote 10 years ago, as opposed to like, what do I like now? Like what I listen to now is like, couldn't be more different from what I listened to back then. Um, but yeah, I would say, hopefully that's a sufficient answer to that question. The perfect answer, man. Yeah. You killed Fuck it. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell thank yes. Thank, thank you, Nadine. Uh, Brian, you're up next and hypothetically last. 
Uh, simple, quick question. You, you mentioned that you have a eclectic taste in music and whatnot. What are you currently listening to? And what's the last thing that you listened to that had a different sound or vibe to it? Oh my goodness gracious. What a good question. Um, so aside from, I've been listening on it to be very honest. I've been listening to the spent case EP that my band's been working on. Cause we've been doing the whole mixing process. So a lot of my free listening has been dedicated towards that and just grinding those songs in my head on different speaker sets and things like that to try and like see what the right mix is. But honestly, like, Oh man, I've been really into like, uh, I listen to like, I don't even know if you would call it like R and B or stuff that's not like there's a genre called hyper pop that artists like a hundred Gex are a part of who I love. Um, there's a lot of artists in that genre that I feel like infuse more R and B elements to their music. And I've really been in to a lot of shit like that. There's an artist called Breakins who put out a record called hypochondriac, uh, about a, I think it was a year ago or just over a year ago. And it's a phenomenal record front to back. Um, there's a lot of guitar on it, but it's also like crazy electronic production. And the kid's voice is like beautiful. Um, and just his like the way he writes songs, I think is really cool. And the way that album flows is really cool as far as creativity goes. And like outside of the box shit, that's probably been one of my favorites in recent memory. Um, on the metal side, I would probably say that Niving record again, Agonal Hymns. Like that thing just sounds like disgusting and you're getting your ass beat at the same time. And it's like, that's all I want in heavy music. I just want to like, I, I really like when heavy bands these days just go into it where they're like insane. It's like, they're not really like, like I just like the craziness of it. So the more crazy, like death metal shit gets these days, I find it more exciting. Like I miss it when it was more like, dangerous feeling and much more like crazier as opposed to like, Oh man, I got to read this fucking like comic book to understand what the fuck's going on. And like, I mean, that shit's cool too. I don't knock it. Like everything is for everything and everybody. And I love how like metal has branched off in all these different directions where there really could be something for everybody in it. But yeah, I would say creatively speaking, I've been more into artists like uh, break ins. There's this kid named Wubs who's like an R and B kid on the internet. And he like, he only has like a handful of songs out on Spotify. I think he's gotten to me. He sounds like if future wrote like emo music, which makes no sense to me. And when I say it out loud, but when I hear it, it totally does big on his shit recently. Um, and yeah, I would say those are some of the bigger ones I've been into, uh, as at least currently speaking. Otherwise, like if I'm really looking for a dose of creativity, the 1975 is like one of my favorite bands that really challenges themselves and pushes themselves outside of the box, but like still retains an identity, which I think is a really cool thing. Um, like that, that album notes on a conditional form that they put out is brilliant. In my opinion, it's like 22 songs or something, but it's all over the place. There's so many cool sounds they experiment with and so many different like songwriting uh, techniques and just like ideas that they use. I don't know. It's great stuff. So I would, I, that's a long answer for your question, but that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what I've been on recently speaking. Hell yeah. No, that's awesome, dude. Uh, it, it's interesting to hear too, because I've, I've also heard kind of the opposite where some artists in whatever position in the band, they like to maybe not listen to music so much so they're not influenced. I don't, I'm not saying that influences your stuff, but I know they kind of put listening to anybody else in the back burner while they're focused on something. But yeah, no, it's it's always interesting to hear it's like we're all obviously here because of metal, but people that connect on different levels with different kinds of music for whatever reason, you know. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, West Coast Jerry, go for it. Hey, what's up, Jason? What's um, up, man? Uh, not much, man. Uh, more recommendations. You've mentioned R&B quite a few times. I don't know jack shit about R&B. It's not generally my thing. I know stuff from like the 90s. What would you recommend R&B wise to someone who doesn't listen to it? Oh my God. If you have any streaming service, any like nineties R&B playlist usually has all of the bangers on it, in my opinion, but there's, there's so much in that world. Um, I really like, uh, fuck, there's a, there's a scene in like England from back in the day that was much more like garage music mixed with R&B. Um, so artists like that, I really fuck with. I'm trying to think of like Craig David is a big example. He's got a song called, uh, fuck, I forget. I'm, now I'm blanking on it because it's like I'm on the spot. But his biggest song um, is a really good example of that. It's like a garage beat with just like a fucking R killer R&B lines all over it. He's great. Uh, there's an artist um, 
actually, he's a singer. His name is No Rome. He's an artist from the Philippines. He's more of a modern example of R&B, um, but he's got an EP called Crying in the Prettiest Places, which is like one of my favorite releases of all time. It's also more of like a modern take on it. So there's a lot of R&B feel to it, but he kind of experiments it in different with like different textures over it. So I feel like that's a good recommendation. Um, I really like Brockhampton's R&B leaning songs like songs like Sugar, um, songs like Victor Roberts, like at the end of that shit, it's just like so powerful. And like, I don't know, it's something just clicked in my brain at some point in my life where all of a sudden I just started hearing like all these incredible singers and I'm like, fuck, this is so sick. Like these people are so fucking talented and they could do like, they're doing like Olympics with just like singing. It's like when people look at like death core bands and they're just like, this guy could do highs, lows, mids, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever the technique happens to be. It's like with R and B, I feel like it fascinates me more. So like I was, I would say that there's all in like classic, like R and B groups, like, uh, from the nineties where they were putting dudes together that like didn't get along, but their vocals were like amazing. There's like a ton of projects like this where like, um, they come together and then they break up cause they couldn't get along. Cause they were, it was kind of like this record label was like, yo, these three singers are sick. Let's put them on a, like there's a group called LSG. They have a, an amazing, one amazing record and they never did anything after that. Cause they couldn't get along with each other. Um, but yeah, I would say those are some good starting points. Um, there's probably more. I should have been more prepared for some R and B recommendations. <laughs> but, I don't think you expected to have an R and B question on the metal. No, I, I I definitely didn't. So, but it's cool. I mean, I'm glad that you're open to checking it out. I think anybody should like try to fuck with some more music, at least maybe yes. in that regard. Because like, maybe like there's so palette, much people. Yeah, definitely. Um, or at least take a taste. You know, it's yes. like where the where the parents at the dinner table saying, "Yeah, just taste Eric, it." Erica Badu, amazing R&B singer. Oh, she's yeah. great. I, and she's familiar with her for sure. I like her yeah. stuff. She's got some amazing music, amazing records out there. Um, even my girlfriend put me out of this Janet Jackson song. I can't remember what it's fucking called, but we've been listening to it. Like, she'll put it on all the time. And, like, at first I was like, I didn't think anything of it. And by the second time I heard it, I was like, yo, this fucking bangs. Like, the chorus is sick. I have to look up what it's called. She's going to be watch this and be mad that I don't remember. So I apologize. But <laughs> um, it is good. It's, I mean... And it's really everywhere. Like, I feel like I've had to do more because, like, I'm so familiar with metal. I've listened to it my whole life. I feel like it's easy for me to find new music in that world. But R&B, it's more like I don't really always know where to look. So I will go to Spotify and look up, like, recommended artists, recommended playlists, like, just things that kind of carry that that sound that I like in R&B. Because it could be all over the place. Sometimes R&B gets way too cheesy for me, too. And I'm just like, I can't fucking do this. And I just need to turn it off. But other times it just hits perfectly and I'm just like, I love the way that this sounds. I love the runs. How many runs can they put into one line? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. West Coast Cherry, like, uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, Jason, this has been amazing. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. I have one last question. Um, before that, I want to talk about our mutual appreciation of Crocs. Oh, let's go! <laughs> Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Big mutual appreciation. Dude, I, I love them. I still have my one pair. I don't know about you there, but but I, I, I need a new pair, and I want Crocs to hit me up with, with a collab. Uh, t talk to me about uh, your love of Crocs and why you don't play drums with them. Well, I will and I won't, but like, I, like if I'm fucked up enough, Matt, I will play a full set in Crocs <laughs> and not give a shit and just say everybody can eat shit if they have a problem with it. Like, if I'm really, like, fucked up and high and I'm like, let's go. I can do it. Like... But once you see like Ken from Aborted play with Crocs, oh, it's just exactly. like, yeah, yeah, I can't even fucking touch it. But yeah. I started wearing them uh, when I first worked a kitchen job at a restaurant. I was like a dishwasher. But it was not like my pizza. first job. Yeah, not pizza. It was not pizza. It was, I was a dishwasher <laughs> and I was like 17 and I had this pair of like the, at the time they were called the Bistro Crocs because they were designed to be worn in kitchens. But it was so comfortable that I was just like, oh, these are like the most comfortable shoe I've ever fucking worn. So then like. You get this whole divisive thing where people feel like they have to have a compulsion to be like Crocs are ugly, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you know what? Like, look at half of like the shoes that come out in actual streetwear these days. And like, you know, it's like it, it's insane. And it's like there's so many different looks out there. Like it's like when Kanye was putting shoes out and everybody was like, who the fuck would wear these? It's like people are spending twelve hundred dollars on these pairs of fucking shoes. Like 
I get sometimes people have like a fucking vendetta against Crocs, but I say don't knock it until you try it. They're they very may look a little obnoxious, but they are so comfortable. I love wearing them on tour. I usually like buy a pair for tour before we go on a long run and in general, just because it's like so it's so comfortable. You could wear them in a shower if you need to take a shower. Like you could wear them with socks on, socks off. Like, like they're that so shower like after, in Portland. I don't know if you you made your way down into the basement and saw that oh, beautiful yeah. shower in that green that room. We- I sure, I sure. <laughs> oh, what's up, Spongo? It was you the whole time, Alex. And you didn't have your camera. Look at him. You motherfucker. I should have guessed that. But <laughs> hello, Alex. <laughs> but yeah, Crocs are lit. I put Alex on the Crocs, like, and he's got big ass feet, and he got a pair, and he loves them. They're and I'm great. Just like, yeah, this is the fucking shit. Crocs are awesome. Like. They look silly. I get it. Like, I don't give a shit. I love them. And like, they're so comfortable. I would like to, I feel like the real reason these days I don't play drums in them is because I'll play in shoes. Then once I'm done and I tear up the kit and it's back in the trailer, when you put on your Crocs, it's like, it's true. Heaven. It's true. No, it's, heaven. Yeah, yeah. it's heavenly. I did yeah, that it's on like, that I'm tour. I'm off the clock yeah. now. Yeah. It's like, I'm <laughs> off the clock. I could chill. Like I could walk right. It just feels like all of that energy you wasted and you're tired of standing, it's like it all just shoots back into you with the Crocs on. I'm like, I can stand for another <laughs> seven hours and be fine. Um, but I love them. I probably have, I'm not even shitting you, Matt. I probably got like seven pairs of Crocs. Really? Like, okay, so I, I need to invest my, oh, in a yeah. new pair. I have, uh, I just bought a pair because my, uh, my lady is very particular about how she keeps her living space and she doesn't like people wearing outdoor shoes inside. So I bought a specific pair of indoor Crocs trunks. just to wear Hell at her yes. place. Yeah. They're lit too. They're, uh, they're like neat. They look like, like that safety yellow, like crossing guard type color. So I wear them. I'm like, I'm here to help you cross the street. <laughs> Not really, but that's how I feel when I wear them. They're very comfortable, but yeah, I w- I swear by them. Like I, at this point, like I used to like, I, there was a point in my life where I'm like, fuck, do I really want to be like a croc guy? And then I'm like, fuck that. I do want to be a croc guy. They're comfortable. They're great. Like, I wish they would. I wish they would sponsor me, too, and be like, here's a pair because you go on tour, or, uh-huh. you know, or some shit like that. Do some but, videos playing drums this, with these. Right. You know. Check this out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a bad idea. But, yeah, I'm glad that you fuck with them. As soon as I saw you, Adam, on, I was like, you get it. You understand. <laughs> I've had my pair for fucking ever for, for 10, yeah. years, 10 years at least. Unbelievable. And that's the thing. They they last yes. forever, and then they still feel comfortable. And you look at the bottoms, and you're like, these are torn to shit, but I'm still comfortable in no. them. I'm going to invest yeah. in a new pair before my next tour. And they're they're pretty affordable, too. Like, compared to, like, designer shoes and shit like that, like, they're not, like, if you get a basic croc, like the regular model, or even some of the, like, higher-end ones, it's not, like, an arm and a leg to afford them. So no, it's no, kind of nice. Typically, like, runners, uh, you should buy, yeah. most people don't do this, but you should buy new runners every three months, because it's only good for so many X amount of kilometers. Exactly. I feel like yeah. Crocs outstretch that. Definitely. <laughs> it's the cross light plastic the cross light plastic formula that Crocs are known oh, for. See, you're better. Know. You're better but, than I am. They're gonna endorse you now. I have I just bought it up. <laughs> I have one last question. A classic sure. Vox and Hops wrap up question. You don't you don't indulge too much in beer, but every once in a while when we overindulge, it happens to all of us. Uh what is your hangover cure? Oh man, honestly, like eating shitty food, probably it's very, I'll be honest with you. It's very rare. Even when I do drink excessively, it's rare that I feel like hung over to the point where I'm like, Oh, like I'm shot. Um, but I would say drink liquid IV before you go out drinking, you will notice a difference the next day, especially if you're keeping yourself hydrated. Um, but I would say, What's my favorite fucking hangover food? There's so much good shit. Chicago's just an endless sea of good food, and I feel like any of it is great. But uh, Rick Benny's breaded steak sandwich, it's this big fucking breaded steak on, like, um, a roll, and you get, like, they slather it in marinara sauce. They put mozzarella cheese and hot peppers on it, like jardinera. I don't fuck with jardinera, so I get mine without. But <laughs> that's some great hanger, hangover food. It's, like, huge. I always feel like full as fuck when I eat it. And it's definitely that food that like absorbs the alcohol. Um, I feel that'd be my answer. (laughs) Jason, thank you so, so much for taking the time, hanging out with me with the thirsty Thursday gang, talking about your life, talking about beer, talking about metal, talking about all kinds of R and B. I had a great time. I hope you did as well. Massive cheers to you. Uh, Thirsty Thursday gang, unmute yourselves. It never works. It always makes me laugh. When I'm editing it, make some noise for Jason from Warforge, from Spend Case. Make some noise because when I edit this, I'm going to giggle because it never works. Woo!
Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an awesome Thirsty Thursday virtual hang. It had been so long since I've conducted a live interview at a Thirsty Thursday hang, and uh, I truly feel bad about that. It's just life just got in the way the first Thursdays of the month for many years. I recorded these live interviews, and then a lot of these Thursdays I ended up being on tour or just coming back from a tour, and it just didn't pan out. So massive apologies to the Thirsty Thursday gang. I love and appreciate each and every one of you, and I promise that I am striving to host more live interviews at Thirsty Thursdays throughout 2024 whenever I can. Jason, you ruled. What a great guest. What an awesome, awesome human. I had so much fun connecting with you uh, throughout the Carnival of Death tour, and I'm very, very happy to have had you with us at this Thirsty Thursday hang. Uh, The gang loved you, and I think you made a bunch of new fans. I'm very stoked to hear that brand new Warforged material that you're working on. And I'm stoked that you are expressing yourself in a new project, Spend Case. Go check it out, people. Massive cheers, Jason. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate you very, very much. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week that contains all of the details of everything that has happened in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. You will get to see which episodes I dropped recently. You will also get to see which episodes I have coming up. You will get to hear about any projects I have in the works for the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, and you will also be updated on whatever I got going on with Cryptopsy. That's right. Cryptopsy, we just dropped our brand new album back in September of 2023, and we are doing a whole bunch of stuff. We are planning a massive 2024. Right now, we are in Europe on the Unquestionable Blasphemy Tour alongside Atheist, Almost Dead, 72 Legions, and Monastery. And then after that, we are coming back to the U.S. and some Canada dates alongside the mighty Death to All. That's right. I'm so stoked that Cryptopsy is opening up that tour, the Scream of Perseverance Tour. I am so goddamn I'm stoked about that. And we even have some more things in the works that I'm super stoked about. You also get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently. And you will get to see which albums Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' metal architect, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist. There's always a lot of stuff going on in the world of the Vox and Hops metal podcast, and I hate when you miss a single thing. So do me a favor and sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hospital Podcast is brought to you by Sound, Hella Media, and Evergreen Podcasts. I will be back next week with another episode on Tuesday with Brad Tomlinson of Jackknife Brewing. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,